Hello everyone, this is Kevin at Tree of Life Nursery. Thank you for joining us for another virtual workshop. Today's workshop is entitled The Art and Science of Butterfly Gardening. The art is, will be presented by Patty Race, who will show us just how to plant a butterfly garden into containers. Following by that will be Mike Evans and Katie Newman, who will show you how to plant into the ground and display a beautiful butterfly garden that will also attract butterflies. The science portion will be presented by our good friend and colleague, Bob Allen, who will show us just why the monarch butterfly is so special. I hope you enjoy. This is Patty. I have been here for quite a while doing potting classes. Maybe you have joined us for one of our workshops on Saturday. But today we're going to feature our butterflies and we're going to put them into this nice beautiful green container. This is all part of the Festival of Butterflies. We have our box here which is called our Butterfly Bundle. It has a selection of six plants for $35 and you can order this online and pick it up at the nursery. So you can see there's an array of plants in here and I will talk about them a little bit more as we're planting. Along with that, you will get a packet of information about the plants and other butterfly information for you. And you don't forget to go into the store because we have books and we have pamphlets and we have fun things for the kiddos and we have pins with monarch butterflies on them. And also this handy dandy butterfly pick, which we're gonna use today also. So first of all, we're going to start with um, a nice good container. And at the very bottom, you've got to make sure it has a hole. And to cover the hole so that the soil doesn't just keep coming out, we're going to use a piece of pottery that's been broken. It is concave so that the water um, it isn't completely blocked. And you put it right down along the bottom. We're going to fill up this container for uh, about half full. Okay, so now we have the pot about half full. And at this point, I like to add a little bit of water. The soil is on a little bit dry side. And so we want to make sure that the medium that we have, that we're using is wet enough before we get started. And of course, it's gonna be dripping out the bottom. So we're gonna make kind of a mess, but that's okay. We'll clean it all up later. So mix it around a little bit. This soil that we're using is a Tree of Life nursery mix. It is similar to what we plant our plants in um, for sale. And it makes really great potting soil. It drains very well and it has nutrients in it along with forest mix. So then we're gonna place our plants in there. Now we're talking about butterfly plants that we have selected. And so what makes a butterfly um, attracted to these plants is this cluster of flowers. This is a Ribes verbena, excuse me, <laughs> verbena lilacina, and uh, so uh, lilac verbena. And if you notice, this might look like just one flower, but there's a lot of little flowers there. And so that helps the butterfly get nectar in one place, not have to go from flower to flower to flower and waste energy. It's um, very effective and efficient for them that way. So this is gonna go into the pot. So, and of course, the monarchs are always attracted to narrow leaf milkweed and other milkweeds too. But um, their native ones are narrow leaf milkweed, and the other one that we sell here at the nursery is called showy milkweed. So, this one, of course, has narrow leaves, and the monarch looks for this plant to lay eggs on. The larva will eat only this plant, and that's how they grow big and strong and become a butterfly. So that's going to go into our pot also. And we always have to have some buckwheat. Buckwheat is an overall great butterfly attracting plant. It also has a cluster of flowers when it blooms. It's white and it's just um, a really delightful plant. This one is the Dana Point buckwheat. So that's going to go into our plant planter also. Of course we need some gray and also a salvia. A salvia will attract 
uh, butterflies and hummingbirds, so that's a, a double. And it has this wonderful uh, gray foliage, very scented, and you can also use it for um, other uses. Um, you know, of course, um, it was a ceremonial plant used by the indigenous people, it still is today. It's always good to have your own in the garden instead of harvesting it in the wild, which has become popular, but a no-no. So got to have one of those. So here we go. I'm going to take these out for a moment and get planted. So I can see I need a little bit more soil. Not quite, these plants are small, um, in small containers, I should say, and they are, these are four inch containers. And in the butterfly bundle, you will also get to select six of the plants. Uh, so there's some others in, that are for the selection that I haven't chosen for this pot. I don't think that we can fit too many or all six in this one pot. But in your garden, you could select um, all six and put them in there. In a container, the plants will grow only to a certain size because they have a restricted area. And we don't want to make it too crowded for them. So we're going to place this one just right in the center because he's kind of tall. That's the buckwheat. Got to have a little bit of a lip in here so the water can rest um, in there and not flow out too fast. Make it up a little bit higher. Still low. Okay. So some color right now. Put our verbena just kind of tucked in here, spilling out over the edge. Got to put in our milkweed. Let's put that one just kind of off to the side here so the butterfly can find it, that monarch butterfly. And of course our white sage. White sage typically grows to be about five feet and spread about five feet, but guess what? In this pot, it's going to stay smallish and just be wonderful addition for this pot. So now we've got our plants placed in here. I'm going to add a little bit more soil. Tuck that around the sides. Got to make sure your plants are thoroughly watered before you put them in too. One more small scoop over here. So as you can see, you kind of you need a, an area where you can really um, spread out and make a mess because that's what I've done. Sometimes it's best to plant your plant right where you're going to place it because it gets kind of heavy in these containers. And so that might be the ideal place. I'm going to give it just a tiny bit more water. When I get it placed in the area, this particular pot, when I get it placed in the area I want it to be, I will then water it more thoroughly. So what makes a California pot? We have California plants. We have rocks, because when you go hiking, you're going to find rocks all over. So we're going to place some rocks in here. And sticks. Got to have some sticks. Now, of course, that's going to make the pot even heavier, but you, if you plant it right where it's supposed to be placed in your garden, it will be just fine. So all these plants are going to be great for the sunshine, so that's exactly where you're going to want to be putting it. So sticks are another popular thing to use, so I'm going to make this fit just right. It kind of gives it this nice finishing touch, and that's a place for a butterfly to land or a hummingbird. And then the rocks, when they warm, the lizard will be attracted to that. And put another piece right over here. Let's see. Also a place for the chrysalis. Yes, the chrysalis can hang from the, um, the, the branches of this. 
Well, because it's a butterfly plant, we're going to stick in this little butterfly pick that we have for sale here at the store. And there's also, you know, pieces of bark that you can use. Uh, this is a, a piece of dried manzanita. So I might want to just kind of crumble some of this on top just to kind of give a, a, like a little finished look. Right, so there we have it. Again, the verbena lilacina, the narrow leaf milkweed, the buckwheat that is Dana Point, and the white sage, which you can even use to make tea. I'm going to give it another shot of water. And this is what you can create if you buy one of our butterfly bundles. So don't forget to come visit our store, visit us online, order your butterfly bundle and pick it up at the nursery and come and say hi. Thanks for joining us. Tree of Life Nursery, loving the idea that butterflies and gardens are like a, mm, what are they like? Like uh, coffee in a cup. <laughs> Where did Dakota go? So we're here. Dakota, the nursery dog, just took off for the shade. Don't blame him. Katie Newman is here with me. I am Mike Evans. Katie's going to talk a little bit about Festival of the Butterflies and the butterfly bundles that we have in preparation for that event as well as for the rest of the season and then I will proceed to plant a few plants to give a demonstration on exactly how you successfully plant a native plant or for that matter any plant. So I'm going to turn the uh, show here over to Katie and while I have a moment thank Kevin Allison who's over there behind the camera as always directing, producing and keeping us all on track. Katie, yes. what are we going to say about butterflies and the butterfly bundle? Well, we have these beautiful butterfly bundles available for purchase for curbside pickup at the nursery so you don't have to come in and search around, although we are open to the public. Um, we're just encouraging social distancing and wearing masks. Please and thank you. And in this butterfly bundle, you can mix and match which species you want. We have both uh, uh, nectar sources for all kinds of butterflies as well as host sources for the monarch butterflies. So you have two different choices of milkweed. Thank you, Mike. You have verbena lilacina or lilac verbena. We have white sage. We have yarrow, which is blooming right now and looking gorgeous. White sage mm -hmm. right here. And then we have Dana Point buckwheat, which is one of my favorite buckwheats. All of these are really great and beneficial for the butterflies, and that's why we put them together. The Normally, these plants are only available in one-gallon containers, so having them in four-inch is really nice because they're easier to handle. If you're not used to planting with natives, they can get established in your garden or in your containers a lot easier. So uh, we are really excited to be offering this for you for Festival of the Butterflies, and we hope that you come in soon to check them out or visit our website site soon to check them out. Oh, look at this showy milkweed right so, here. Katie, what's the deal here? We've got two species of milkweed plus other plants. Many people think that if they plant milkweed that's all they need to do to provide butterfly habitat. So why these other plants and why two species of milkweed? Well, we have two species of milkweed because everyone likes something a little bit different, right? The narrow leaf milkweed is a little bit more native to Orange County area, while the showy milkweed is more Northern California, but both are beneficial for the monarch butterfly caterpillars. Um, the showy milkweed gets a little bit larger of a leaf on it. It's a little bit more, I don't know, of a pretty plant for the garden. It has showy pink flowers, hence the common name, I'll showy milkweed. You. There and, you go. And then why these other plants? 
And then we have the Verbena lilacina, which is a really great nectar source for all kinds of butterflies. So not only monarchs and uh, swallowtails and skippers, but pretty much everything you can imagine. You're also going to get bees and other pollinators in your garden. So we just wanted to help you create diversity in your garden, whether you have a container on your patio or you have a large landscape that you can plant tons of these in. We want to create a small habitat and create more habitat for all kinds of pollinators so and butterflies. So the plants that are milkweed provide food mm -hmm. for the young, the immature, the caterpillars. Mm -hmm. And then the other plants in the bundle provide flowers which give nectar to the adults. That's right. So you have the whole life cycle of butterflies in your garden with nectar plants and food plants. What's with these little papers that Ooh, you So have these here? are our butterfly bundle um, informational packets. So if you are new to native California plants, you can learn a little bit more about each species in the butterfly bundle, where to plant them, how much sunlight they need, how much water they need, and what kind of species they're good for. So um, we made this especially for this butterfly bundle. It's available on our website for download, um, or if you're picking up your bundle at the nursery, we'll give you a hard handout like this one. This is great. Okay, so the, what we're going to do next uh, is we're going to plant some of these plants in the ground, showing exactly how to do it. And Katie, would you stick around for a little while and make sure I do it right and also ask any questions you might have that would help um, our viewers understand what we're doing? I suppose so. Okay, we're going to plant plants next. Okay, here we are. The thing to, a couple things about holes, Katie and everyone. There's already a hole there. You just have to get the dirt out of the way to find it. That makes digging a lot easier. I'm glad you laughed at that. Appreciate it. Door. Also, we dig our holes oversized. A good rule of thumb is twice as wide and half again as deep as the container. Twice as wide, space around the root ball and half again as deep as the nursery root ball. We'll talk about that once we're down on hands and knees. For larger plants you can use a tape measure to make sure you've got it right. We do not like to have where the soil is slick from a shovel scraping it so be sure and nick up and notch up the edges to keep the roots from going round and round in a bathtub effect. And during warm weather, don't pre-dig all your holes days and days in advance because you'll lose valuable soil moisture just by the hole being open in the hot weather. So dig the holes the same day that you're going to plant. In rainy weather, you can pre-dig and let those holes fill up with rainwater and that's to your advantage. Right now we have some pretty dry soil that we've dug into, so we're gonna fill these holes with water using a soft rain nozzle on the end of the garden hose. And you do this because you have to have the water on. Usually helps. Because you want to have water below the root ball once you are planting. So the best thing to do here is to fill the holes with water and allow it to percolate into the soil before you start planting. You can also wet this material that came out of the hole, which is technically called the backfill, because it will be going filling back into the hole. What do you think, Katie? Does that make sense? Yeah, what if the water takes a really long time to drain out of the hole? Okay, what if the water takes a really long time? My thoughts on that are, especially if you're planting a tree and most shrubs, they'll probably outlive you. Take the extra half hour, hour, day, few hours to do it right. Even if you're planting plants that you probably will outlive, do it right. Because why do it not right? <laughs> so <laughs> Makes sense. Let the water drain out Actually, the technical term is percolate or infiltrate in percolate. to the soil. And you will have a successful planting because the soil will be moist below the root ball. 
So how did you figure out how to space all these plants from one another? I see this one's a lot further back than some of those ones up there. Well, instead of just planting, great question, Katie. Instead of just planting one plant to show how to do it, I want to show how easy it is to plant several plants at one time because you create a pattern and a rhythm in your work. But we have some taller plants in the back from the front viewing spot. We've also massed, uh, that is, put uh, several in a, in a mass of the verbena mm -hmm. three will go in one section because butterflies see color in masses. So best not to necessarily sprinkle the butterfly plants out around the garden like salt and pepper on scrambled eggs. Best to put them in areas where it's solid mass of that color. The butterflies see that when they're in flight much better. And the variation of plants that we're using are all pollinator friendly and are all butterfly plants. Here are the two milkweeds from the packet. We've got five gallon, one gallon, and four inch pots that we're going to be planting today. And all of these are available for purchase at Tree of Life right now? All of these are available at, for purchase at Tree of Life Nursery. You would know the answer to that question better than I. It's true, I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what do you think, Katie? It looks like your plant is sticking out a little bit higher than the surrounding dirt area. Very good observation. It is. We want this to be a little bit higher. One, it will settle a tiny bit. And two, we never want the crown, this collar, to be lower than the surrounding grade. Always remember, the crown ends up in the center of the hole, just like the drain in your, kit, in your bathroom sink. But it is not the low spot in the hole like the drain in your bathroom sink. There's a slight mound, and then it gets low, you'll see. Let's use this as a straight edge from grade to grade. You can see that I've got my crown of my plant about an inch to an inch and a half higher, built atop a mound of pre-moistened soil. We knocked the edge of the hole into the soil because we like topsoil and we like this fluted edge to direct water where we want it into the root ball area. I'm going to get about halfway planted and then we're going to water, thoroughly water. And the advantage of doing it this way is that while that water is running, you can come over to your next plant with the hole dug and the water percolated into the soil and you can get it ready while this one is thoroughly soaking before we finish planting it. So Are you using I, any amendment? We're not using any amendment today because the soil is excellent here, topsoil, alluvial topsoil. And the only reason to use amendment with native plants is if the soil is extremely heavy clay or very problematic, mostly clay, because you want a nice transition between the root ball and the surrounding soil. And that transition would be made up of an amended soil, one third organic compost, two thirds native soil. Our soil is so beautiful, we can just put it right up against the root ball. Okay. Okay, so we keep the hose running the whole time and we Oh look, there's a dusky wing on the verbena already. This happens every time you, your plant, look at that. You bring native plants home and you start seeing native pollinators, hummingbirds, insects, songbirds showing up at your garden the moment you get them out of the car. It's absolutely Pretty amazing. exciting stuff. I am noticing this water disappearing at a great rate into an old gopher hole. <laughs> so we're definitely getting some deep water here. Okay, so that we're gonna allow to soak in before we finish planting it. And we're gonna use the water here to pre-irrigate the whole area beneath the root ball. And again, we're going to make sure that when we're finished, the crown of our plant is located slightly higher, not 
three inches higher, just an inch or so. Firm this up. You can gently break off the corner, get the roots going in the right direction. Give it a little massage, mainly to express your tender concern for its well-being and root to get massage. the roots going out. What did you say, Katie? Root massage. A root massage. Slightly higher than the surrounding grade. Looking toward the front. Time to start returning some of the backfill in around this hole. And you can see the pattern that we're developing by breaking off this harsh corner, creating that fluted edge, setting the hose here, slightly lower flow. Why don't you want the stem to get moist? Well, we, we don't want this. When the basin, because we're going to create a basin, when the basin is created, yes, the water will sit in here and may even be around the collar or the crown. But as it percolates into the soil, this will be the first thing in the basin to become dry and the water will stay in the basin around it because of rot. You do not want any kind of root rot or stem rot to occur as a result of the collar being submerged permanently by mud, sediment, things that wash in. We've got lots of plants to plant, but let's finish up this five gallon and see what it's going to look like. So we know it's thoroughly watered. We put water in the planting hole. We put water as we put, as we put backfill in the bottom of the planting hole. We put water around the sides as we were returning the backfill into the hole. And so we saw with our own eyes, which is how we see everything, by the way, Mostly. <laughs> Unless you're dreaming. Water where it belongs. Deep in the soil, all around the plant. Are you convinced, Katie Newman, that there are no dry spots in this planting hole or around this root ball? I'm pretty convinced. Are you going to give it another good watering once you get all that good top soil watering. on there? This is what we're going to do next. You got it. We're going to create this basin using the excess back backfill material, especially on this downhill side in this case. Dusky wing! Slightly building a berm around and doing that. Look at this shovel works by itself. All I have to do <laughs> is hold the handle. This is one of those automatic shovels and you have to look long and hard for these. But if you find one, don't lend it out. You'll never see it again. Look at this thing work. Easy peasy. Isn't it neat? It just works by itself. I just hold the handle. Especially for me. I'm just going to have you do it for me all the time. <laughs> so we're going to make sure that our root ball is not sitting up in the sun. That would be terrible because the sun would dry out those tender feeder roots near the surface. And then... Why do you do such a deep watering? We do such a deep watering because we don't want to have to lose this plant to drought in addition we don't have to come back and water this plant for several days because we know that the hole and the surrounding soil and the root ball have all been watered adequately. So you see the crown slightly higher than the basin in the center of a hole which has fluted sides. There's water all around and under. You create a slight watering berm, basin berm. Now watch this. This should be really fun. You can see the basin filling with water, which will soak into the soil. You can see the crown is going to get wet here. It's like a in funnel. A full basin. But as the water disappears into the ground below, the crown will be in a safe, dry, Spot, position, what about mulch? Elevation. Mulch or top dress could be applied at this point in the planting hole very sparingly. Just about a half inch of mulch or, or top dress, enough to shade the soil slightly. There's no need in, to put these huge, thick 
layers of organic mulch or top dress, especially near the plant in a planted area. Now, if you're really fancy and you don't mind seeing what looks like a buffalo came and routed out looking for some kind of grub, you make a secondary watering ring outside the berm of the first basin. You make that watering ring all the way around the plant. I'm just giving you an example so that you can water in the ring and you can water in the basin. And what you're doing over the long haul is you're coaxing the water to soak down into the region where you want the roots to go, which is out to become an extensive, healthy root system. During the time of that the plant is becoming established, you will need to water the surrounding soil, the berm and the basin, less frequently than the root ball of the plant. So until all those roots are everywhere throughout this planting area, you have to maintain the nursery root ball as a separate entity. Let's finish up this one gallon very quickly here. Fluted edge on the planting hole, crown higher than the surrounding grade, get halfway up or a little more than halfway up. We already know there's water in the hole, water in the backfill, run the water while we go to the next plant and you just always have something going. It's a very, very efficient way to plant. One, two, three. on paw with those farm implements, those tools, you know that picture. But we're proud of our work. What you could do if it was your garden is put a little top dress, some nice chunky organic bark, half inch redwood would be great just to dress it up, make it pretty, don't make it too deep around the planting hole and in the bare areas. Sprinkle some seed if it were fall through spring, get some wildflowers. But what we have here, you watched it, all the ground is wet, all the plants are thoroughly soaked the holes were generous and proper for each plant. And come on, butterflies, here's your new home. What do you think, Katie? I think it looks fantastic. I'm it's, very excited for all our butterfly friends. It's a start. She's excited for our butterfly friends, but I want to tell you one thing. The beauty of native plant gardening is doing it and then thinking and dreaming about it and especially watching it grow. <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome and thank you to Mike and Patty for showing us how to plant a butterfly garden. We have with us now joining us is Bob Allen, our good friend and colleague. Bob is the lead author of Wildflowers of Orange County and the Santa Ana Mountains and he's going to present with us today uh, his presentation entitled What's So Special About Monarch Butterflies? Take it away Bob. All right, thank you Kevin. Good to see you. My talk today is titled, What's So Special About Monarchs? My talk is sponsored by Tree of Life Nursery, my good friends over there. We'll talk about uh, adult monarchs, migration, relatives and lookalikes, the life cycle of monarchs, meet the milkweeds, and also try to get you to plant native milkweeds and things that the adult butterflies will feed on. First off, adult monarchs have uh, orange. They're mostly orange with black and some white. On the left is a male. They have thin bands of black scales on the wing veins and in what's called an androconal patch on the second cubital vein. If you can see my pointer, it's right down here by the abdomen. That's where the patch is. Here's a female on the right. She has thicker bands of black scales that follow the veins. 
Now compare those as you see, she's also more of an orange color where the males got a little bit more yellow in them and she does not have the androconal patches. Monarchs are famous for migration. Those on the east of the Rocky Mountains migrate in the wintertime and end up in Mexico. They spend the whole winter down there in a forest. And then when spring arrives, they start heading northbound, but they stay pretty much to the east of the Rocky Mountains. Here in California, our population is termed the Western population, and they are west of the Rockies. Most of the butterflies west of the Rockies do not go to Mexico. Yeah, a few have, a few have ended up down there, but mostly they come south, they hit the coast of California, and they spend the winter there. You can see in this nice map from Xerxes that there's an orange band right here where they follow, and they're normally along in the wintertime, spending the night on trees within a mile or maybe five miles up the coast. This is what they look like when they overwinter on the trees. A lot of them with their wings closed at night, they look like dead leaves. Then when the sun hits them in the morning, they open their wings up. They may or may not fly for the day. Here, are, uh, here he is, a relative of the monarch. On the right, we see the queen. The queen's native to our deserts. And uh, she feeds on, as caterpillar, feeds on milkweeds that are native to the desert, but she will come over the mountains and end up in Orange County in San Diego and LA, Ventura, Santa Barbara, and San Luis Obispo counties uh, during the summer. They'll show up, sometimes fall. Uh, they're not uncommon here at all. These two queens were photographed right here in Orange County. You can tell them apart by the patterns we went over with with the male. And then on the queen, you can see males and females are both burnt orange, much darker burnt orange than male or female of the monarch. Queens are also smaller on average. There are some lookalikes and people often get these mistaken. So in the upper left, we see a monarch and the upper right, we see a painted lady which lives all across the United States and Mexico. And look for these wing bars right in here, on the front wings right in here. We're looking at these spots. So painted lady has these kind of square looking white wing bars here. Um, on the west coast lady, which only lives along the west coast, She's got orange in the same place, so she's very, very different. Um, on the American lady, orange in those bars right here. The pattern of black right in this area is very, very different between this. On the underside, all, of the, all three of these look very, very different. Notice in the monarch, too, that this area right here, called the discal cell, has no markings inside of it. This is a vein here, there's a couple of veins going here, but there's no markings inside. Right? And all the ladies, that same discal cell is right here and there's markings inside of the discal cell. So a quick and easy way to look for it. Markings in the discal cell and blue spots, sometimes all black, on the hind wings uh, also denotes a lady when monarchs never have blue on them. Now monarch life cycle, fairly straightforward butterfly life cycle. The egg is laid on milkweed, we'll get there in a minute. The egg hatches. The caterpillar crawls around, feeding on the milkweed plants, grows, sheds its skin, grows, sheds its skin, does this five times. And finally, the last time it sheds, it reveals a chrysalis, this nice green chrysalis. And then when it's close to eclosing or emerging from the chrysalis, the chrysalis itself turns clear and you can see the monarch inside. And then it emerges from the chrysalis or it closes, dries the wings, flies around, mates very soon, and then the female starts laying eggs on milkweed and starts the cycle all over again. Monarch adults only live from about one to three months. They're not a super long-lived butterfly. And their caterpillars only feed on milkweeds, mostly the genus Asclepius, but there are some other genera. Our three very common local species are the narrow-leaved milkweed that has white flowers, sometimes with some pink, really skinny leaves. The California milkweed maroon flowers, very hairy. <clears throat> the leaves are in pairs. It's mostly in dry areas of uh, coastal sage scrub and chaparral higher up in the Santa Ana Mountains. It's not a low elevation plant at all. And then woolly fruited milkweed. This is a much lower elevation plant. It too has uh, white flowers, sometimes with a little bit of pink in them. Very wide leaves in groups of twos or threes or fours. You find it at Casper's Wilderness Park, along Ortega Highway, a lot of places like that. 
In Northern California and across other parts of the US, we have showy milkweed, which is white and or pink flowers. It is reported from Northern California. It will grow here in Southern California, but it does need some shade at least part of the day. The other three milkweeds that are native right here in Orange County can handle full sun all day. And that's where you plant them if you were going to use them in a garden. Showy milkweed should be put somewhere near a tree or shrubs where it gets about half a day worth of shade. This is bloodflower, also called tropical milkweed. Um, a lot of people will plant this one. A lot of nurseries sell it. Not a good idea because what happens with this is the plant grows all year round. The native milkweeds here die off in late fall, die off down to the ground, and then in spring they start growing again. Well, what happens with these guys is that uh, monarchs sometimes have on their bodies spores of a protozoan parasite called OE for short. And you can see in the picture of the egg down here, the monarch egg, there are little tiny spores all over that egg. They're really small, very hard to find. They're kind of rust colored, they're shaped like an American football. So what happens with this is the egg hatches. The, the, the young, the first thing the young does in most butterflies, it turns around and it feeds on the eggshell of its own egg. It's its first meal. They'll get the spores on and in the body. The protozoan emerges from the spore, starts to reproduce, and it can affect the caterpillar. It can kill the caterpillar outright. It can also mess up its digestive system. It can uh, do all kinds of things to it. Sometimes when the, when the caterpillar enters the pupil stage, it never emerges. It just turns black and it dies in there. Or when it, it closes, comes out of the chrysalis shell, it's deformed and of course dies. Some adults, if they do make it to what looks to be a fully functioning adult, they'll be underweight and too weak to fly very well. They're pretty obvious when you see them. And uh, so it's really, it's a nasty thing. So what happens with this plant? Because it grows year round, monarchs will lay eggs on it all year round. And if the protozoans on the body of the butterfly, which does happen, the protozoan uh, spores get rubbed off onto the plant and now the plant is infected and a caterpillar can eat it. So our native milkweeds, because they die off in late fall, early winter, uh, they, that dead stem that falls over doesn't present an infection source to the monarchs that come in in the spring that lay eggs on the new growth of the, of the milkweed. So really, if, uh, you shouldn't plant this one, but if you have planted it, don't worry, you, can, you don't have to take it out as long as you follow some simple steps. And that is, cut it to the ground at, by the end of October, leave it not growing. Don't let it regrow. If it starts to regrow, cut it down to the ground. Don't let it regrow until about March 1. Then it will be fine. Make sure any old stocks are disposed of in the trash, not your uh, compost bin. Put them in the trash, not your green waste bin. Put them in the trash. And that will help lower the infection. This parasite's been studied by a lot of researchers. Most recently was Dara Satterfield who looked at this and she proved that, <clears throat> that these are a problem. Um, her dissertation is available, or I think papers she's written have been, have been available. Um, Xerces Society has now written this, the Modern Joint Venture newsletter. They talk about tropical milkweed and the parasite. Here's the butterfly laying eggs on tropical milkweed here. Here's some of the spores, a little close up. Here's what a butterfly infected with it looks like. Again, sometimes they look fine and they can fly. Other times they don't. So here's, here's the advice. You either plant milkweeds native to your area or your state. <clears throat> Cut down the non-native milkweeds to the ground on November 1 and then keep them cut till March 1. And that will really help knock this infection back. So if you really, really like the tropical milkweed, take those precautions that will really help out the butterflies. Uh, this parasite is known to really harm butterfly populations. We don't know if this is the number one reason why monarch numbers have declined, but it definitely is a contributing factor. So please do your part, either plant a native species or uh, do your responsibility as a gardener and cut these things down by these dates. A question I am asked quite often, what, what to do if your caterpillars eat all your milkweed? Well, 
if they're young caterpillars, you must find more milkweed. Contact nurseries. Tree of Life Nursery is a great source for, for um, milkweed plants. Some other nurseries are now carrying it as well. But the young caterpillars have to feed on milkweed. If the caterpillars are older, we call that a late instar, uh, they, they're fine without milkweed, but they do need to eat something. And they'll eat cantaloupe, pumpkin, and other squashes. And you can see in this picture, someone's raised them out and just feeding them that, and they do fine. So have at, you can always get those. Now, why are monarchs in peril? Well, the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation counts overwintering monarchs in California right around Thanksgiving, patterned after the Audubon bird counts. And they came up with a statement from this effort of just doing the same counts in the same place every year, Thanksgiving, right around Thanksgiving time. From this effort, we know that the Western monarch population has undergone a 74% decline over the past 20 years. Used to be in San Clemente State Beach, we'd have 20,000 or more monarchs spending the winter on the trees just at that one place. And now, not so many. In fact, here is a nice graph for the state. This is from 2015. We do have more data, but it's a nice graph I have. 1997, monarch numbers in California were over 1.2 million overwintering. And then it started to decline in 1998, less than 600,000 down to, what is that, about 230,000. And then here, a little bit back up in 2000, and down, 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 down. 2015, the numbers were, looks to be about under 300,000. And then jumping ahead to 2018, just for Orange County, the big graph is for the whole state, just Orange County. In 2018, I observed zero overwintering monarchs in all of Orange County. In 2019, I observed three at San Clemente State Beach. That was it. That was it. I am the volunteer coordinator for the Xerces Society here for Orange County, California. So I did those surveys myself. I've been dealing with monarchs since I was a very little kid. And I know where all the overwintering grounds are. And it's really disheartening. The numbers are way, way down. Why are they down? We're not totally sure. Well, there are threats. And the threats are habitat destruction. So here we have a picture of a bulldozer, bulldozing out habitat, and this is happening all over California. Um, if there's a bulldozer there, if we have habitat conversion to homes or schools or buildings or stores, that means there's no milkweed growing there. If there's no milkweed, there's nothing for the caterpillars to eat. The adults have nothing to lay eggs on. The young have no milkweed, so there's not gonna be a young generation. Pesticides are a huge problem. We are using a lot of pesticides. And here we see a picture of a farm where pesticides are being used. See the, the, the fumes of the pesticide? That's called pesticide drift. It flies over, makes its way to where it was not intended to go. So that's called pesticide drift. So a farmer might spray their crops, but some of the pesticide drifts over to a natural area and kills the plants that are there or kills the insects that are there. And now you've got no monarchs. Another um, pesticide source are homeowners. We're very guilty of this. Funny that you need a driver's license to drive a car, but you don't need a license to spray poison in your own backyard. It's amazing. Commercial applicators require a license. They require education, regular renewals of the education, and a license. And they have to register how much they use and when and why with the state. But homeowners, well, they can spray methyl ethyl death on anything, anytime they want. Huge problem, huge problem. Uh, another thing is we have non-native milkweed and the parasite OE I talked about before. Over in the far right, there's a picture of a monarch trying to emerge from the chrysalis, but it's badly deformed and just dies on the spot. This monarch was infected with OE. And then we have the last one, lack of adult nectar sources. So not only do we not have enough plants for the milkweed plants, for the young to feed on, there's no nectar for the adults to feed on. Adults need nectar. So what can we do about this? Well, there's lots of things we could do. First off, we need to preserve some habitat. We can't make everything look like a concrete jungle. We need to have natural areas set aside, like this picture of beautiful Casper's Wilderness Park here in Orange County. 
where lots of milkweed lives. It's a fantastic place. They have monarchs, they have milkweed, they have open space, they have nectar sources for everything. It's just a great place. So we need to just back off on the pesticides. Homeowners don't need to use pesticides. The only thing you might need a pesticide for is using a bait for ants that get in your house and also treating cockroaches that get in your house. But outside, why would you need pesticides? Fine, you've got a couple of grasshoppers. Let them eat some leaves. It's not an infestation. So we need to be pesticide free. If you care about having the butterflies, you need to drop the pesticides. Um, you need to plant some native milkweed, like these beautiful milkweeds here, and that brings in the butterflies. Monarchs do like the nectar from milkweed. And then we need some adult nectar sources, like the one in the center bottom here. Oh, it's really fun to watch a, a butterfly feed. So in the spring and summer, there's some great plants to use that help to feed the adult butterflies. Things like the milkweeds, woolly fruited milkweed, narrow leaf milkweed, showy milkweed. I showed you those also on screen. White yarrow, lower left corner. California buckwheat, upper left corner, including that beautiful little blue butterfly there. Its caterpillars feed on the leaves of buckwheat and the adults feed on the nectar. So you can bring in those little butterflies. Sages, such as white sage in the upper right, black sage, lower right, and Cleveland sage, kind of center, just off right. Those are fantastic sources of nectar for all kinds of butterflies, monarchs and others. And also verbena, your lower left toward the center, this is verbena lilacina, cultivar called delamina. Uh, verbena lilacina is from Cedros Island in Baja, California. So it's not quite native right here, but it's pretty close. We do have some native species of verbena here. Their flowers aren't as big, uh, but this thing is fantastic. It's a, I call this a monarch magnet. It really brings them in. They love this stuff. Lots of butterflies too. So these are all great plants for you to use. And then what about fall? We often forget about putting in fall blooming wildflowers for butterflies such as the monarch. And so things that bloom in the fall are things like native thistles. No, not those non-native things that got in. We have two species of native thistle right here, and they are fantastic, just beautiful. One, one has a pink flower, like in the upper left. Another has a red-purple flower. I'm going to have a picture on screen. They're both in my book. Um, also, thistles are visited by our state butterfly, the California dog face. That's the one right below the monarch picture there. Dog faces go crazy for purple flowers and they really like thistles. So both of these butterflies will visit all of these flowers. So we have things like coastal golden bush, lower left corner. It's not even in bloom yet, it's almost in bloom. And then rabbit brush, next over from that, which isn't quite in bloom too, but should be in uh, August. Goldenrod, center, starts blooming in late spring and goes through the summer and part of the fall. Sandwash butterweed, with gray leaves, second from right, uh, underused plant. People just don't plant this, it's gorgeous. Casper's Wilderness Park has got several in the creek bed there. You can just look at them, marvel at how beautiful they are. Uh, various asters, that is a genus and a group of the sunflower family, like lower, lower right corner here. Uh, the asters, great things. They really, uh, they really bring in a lot of butterflies. And then upper right, Common sunflower, the native sunflower. Yeah, that's right. It's native to right here. It's the only plant native to North America that's grown around the world for food. Yeah. What you want to do is get the native form of it, the native genotype, which is right, right there in that picture. They don't have the giant sunflower heads. Their heads are about this big. That's the normal form of it. Humans have selected for those giant heads that you see, like in Russian giant. Yeah, they're beautiful but I'd rather see you use the native form of this. It will bring in native butterflies as well. These are all great choices. And there are some non-natives that are worth having in your garden too. Even if you have an all native garden, these are terrific flowers that bring in a lot of butterflies, including monarchs. They will visit these. A study, an ongoing study at University of California, Davis, has shown that these four are the best flowers to put in your garden. Sorry, the best non-native flowers to put in your garden. 
Cosmos. Cosmos pinnate is native to Mexico. That's not that far away. Coneflower, Echinacea, many species in that group, native to the Great Plains all the way to the East Coast and the South, fantastic plant. Uh, Gillardia, the blanket flower, several things come to that. Black-eyed Susan, Rebecca, another beautiful plant. Oh my gosh, I was just at one of my local nurseries today. I mean a real live nursery. And they had all of these, just beautiful. I actually bought three of them. It was great to put in my garden. They're fantastic nectar sources. They really are worth having in your garden. Even if you have an all na native garden like I do, I have a rule, if it's not native, it goes in a nice big pot. And that's where these are gonna go. And I'd like to thank you for hanging around. And we're gonna take it back to Kevin. Okay, well, thank you, Bob. That was a fantastic presentation. And this was a great example. And I like how you mentioned a lot of information in there on what people can do to help this very charismatic butterfly. And one thing you mentioned, and I, maybe you could reiterate that message because I think it's very valid and very important that we get that word out there. Uh, what can people do to help this butterfly? Well, as I mentioned in the talk, there's always more to talk about, but time. Uh, you can uh, avoid using pesticides on your property. It turns out, looking at pesticides, people use pesticides to get rid of pests that attack their non-native plants. Right? So people plant non-natives and then be surprised that non-native pests, by the way, the pests in your garden are not native pests. They're not native species. Right? So we have non-native species acting as pests on non-native species of plants that you put in. And now you want to pesticide to come in and kill all that. Well, it kills everything, everything. So really the best thing to do is plant nothing but native plants, problem solved. You're not gonna get, for the most part, you're not gonna get non-native pests attacking your native plants. So come in, plant native plants, put in some native species of milkweed, and I'm gonna use milk, native milkweed in the broad sense and say that, that uh, the showy milkweed from Northern California, perfectly fine. Uh, give it a shot, put, give it a little bit of shade to seems to do better. But put them all in your garden. And just one plant is never enough with milkweed. You really need to get a handful of them. I've got about six in my front yard and I get caterpillars on them. More the merrier. Because if there's only one plant, it's going to be very hard for her to find that one plant. So, well, I, I couldn't. Yes, Bob, I couldn't agree more. Uh, and even though I work here at Tree of Life, it is very important that you plant the native plants. And it, it comes back, it does a lot for the, the wildlife around, including this species as well. That we have noticed a lot more, uh, or we have a lot of people who really want to get involved and help plant for the, the, the monarch butterfly. And they, they come in, the popularity of people looking for the native milkweeds has definitely increased. So we have ramped up our production and we have many of these uh, native species available now, uh, uh, including inside this uh, butterfly bundle in our four inch containers. But we also have some larger sizes as well. So if you have caterpillars, uh, we have the food sources available for you. And we include and have a lot of other species that Bob mentioned in his talk. And a few other that we have a wide selection of plants that will also provide the nectar for those, for not only the monarch butterfly, but many of other species as well. So Bob, I thank you so much for joining us. And we always love it when we see you here around the nursery, but a Zoom call is also a wonderful way to see you as well. It's not the same. So thank you, Bob. And thank you for everyone who joined us today and all of those watching with the Festival of the Butterflies. Thank you and come on down to Tree of Life. We are open uh, and we would love to see you soon. So thank you and we wish you all the best. Okay, thanks Kevin, bye-bye. Bye-bye.